We speak always about the gospel, but it is good that we reflect on the epistle today because I know that we have spoken of controversial matters the last few weeks, questions of how often one should receive Holy Communion and of how one should prepare to receive Holy Communion, questions that vary in practice from family to family, from community to community, and of which the answer changes from priest to priest. We have spoken about why there are these differences, but the epistle gives us today an important reminder when the, when the apostle says to us, avoid stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels over the law, for they are unprofitable and futile. So, we are called to come into the church. We are called to hear the word of God. We are called to respond from an open and honest heart, as the gospel says. What we are not called to do is argue with one another about how each other is practicing the faith. The gospel is clear. The canons are not difficult. The principle of faith in Christ is obedience in relationship with the church and with the priest. The quarrels and arguments that we might have one with another about the best way to do this are not helpful. Our relationship is to be with the Lord in humility and repentance. If we keep our eyes fixed upon Him, then we have no time to look to the right and to the left to criticize or to imitate or to judge our brother or our sister. We are called to relationship with the Lord and peace one with another. And let us make certain that our relationship with the Lord never becomes cause for us to argue, to judge, to quarrel with one another. Let us continue the liturgy as the apostles on the day of Pentecost in one accord. We are come to the part of the year where I feel every Sunday we see the Lord speaking another parable. And usually when the Lord speaks a parable, he begins by saying, but the kingdom of God is light. And then he tells a story. He outlines a analogy or a metaphor that we are to compare our life in Christ to. And on this occasion, we are given the parable of the sower, of the man out in the field sowing seeds. And he, in the days before mechanized farming, he's reaching into the bag, he's grabbing a handful of seed, of seed and he's flinging it out in an ark so that as he walks, he covers the entire field. But it is an imprecise process, and some of it falls on the rocks, and some of it falls on the path, and some of it falls along the edges where there are thorns and briars growing. And some of it falls on the good ground. And then the Lord says, this is what it is to be in the kingdom of God. Some of the seed that is planted grows up and grows well, but so many of the seeds that fall do not thrive, to say the least, are either trampled or eaten or choked, depending on whether they fall on the rock or in the place where the birds come or in the place where the weeds choke. And truly, this image speaks to the entirety of our life in this world. The sermon that we preach to the children is intended to be a seed, a dangerous thing to speak about, and I ask you all to be attentive and cautious to how they hear it, because God forbid they think I am telling them that they need to have a romance in their life to be fulfilled. But the intent is that as they grow in life, 
as they come to maturity, as they come into the relationships that will carry them through their lives, they remember that the message of the church, even from their childhood, was that this life of marriage is not supposed to be easy, but that the difficulties when they are conquered, when they are mastered, lead to a life of blessing in the Lord. A seed, we pray, that takes root so that they remember when they most need to hear this word. Because advice that is given in the moment is always ignored, but advice that has been in the heart and the mind for a lifetime may suffice to give strength. This is a side note from the sermon. We return now to the theme. But if all of our life in Christ is like a field that is sown with seed, we must reflect, what are we? Are we the earth? Are we the seed? Or is our life to be described by the planting of a seed in a field? And I would urge that we think of this is as the meaning. For the seed that is planted is the Word of God. The words that we hear in church, the grace that is given to us at our baptism, at confession, in communion. The grace of God is given freely and without exception to all who step within the doors of this holy place. But the church itself, the physical structure, is not the ground. Our hearts, are the ground. This leaves us with the question, what if my heart is hard? What if my heart is filled with thorns? What if there are birds, metaphorically, that come in and consume the good word of God when it falls upon the soil of my heart? The hidden meaning of this text is that we, in our rational mind, are the keepers of the fields. We have a responsibility to make the ground of our hearts fertile, to bring forth fruit from the seed that is planted. And this takes effort. We know what it is. We have seen it, perhaps in ourselves, perhaps in a brother, or a sister, or a friend, or a neighbor, or an acquaintance, or in the person next to us in the pew, we have seen what it looks like when the Word of God is choked, or trampled, or dried, or consumed. We know what it is to see zeal spring up for a time and then wither. We know what it is to see those who have been part of the body of Christ, cut themselves off from it for one reason or another. What we must concern ourselves with, therefore, is how to avoid this happening to us. How is it that we make the ground, the soil of our hearts, fertile? and the things that we have said before, to come for communion frequently, so that the seed of the Lord is planted in us regularly, so that our hearts are nurtured not only by our own will and work, but by the hand of God. To prepare for these things by regular fasting and prayer and thought and attention, so that when we come into the church, the words of God do not fall upon deaf ears, but we are prepared to hear. We are looking for salvation in this place. This preparation must be understood as the intent of this reading from the gospel. A field that is neglected and abandoned, except for twice a year or three or four times, will not thrive. Come look at the house that I purchased, and you will see what happens to a home and a yard 
that he is uncared for, even for three or four or five months, because we still haven't fixed it yet. We know this principle. We apply it to any other part of our lives. If we want to advance, we must make effort. But we do not like to apply this to our life in Christ. We do not like to consider that our relationship with God is something that may be defective or deficient. We do not like to consider when we read this gospel that we might not be the good soil in which the seed takes deep root and grows and bears bountiful fruit. This, I think, is why the Lord concludes and says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. We must not be content with our life as we now live it. We must look to Christ, look for transformation, look for a deeper peace, not one that comes from financial security or physical comfort, or relational success, although these are all blessings. The peace in our lives must be a gift of God. It must come from a strong and devoted relationship with Him. And if that is not present in our lives as we feel it ought to be, we are called to allow this gospel to convict us, to call us to renewed action simply to care for and prepare the soil of our hearts to receive and bear fruit from the Word of God. May we remember, may we reflect deeply on this, may we find the remedy that is needed for the garden of our souls, and may the sower bring forth a great harvest from us. God bless you all.